All right. Good morning. Welcome to Archetype Pattern Workshop. This is a school, and it is not a church. You know, we affiliated with a church or religious organization. This school is a nonprofit, non denominational religious and scientific research organization dedicated to proving the existence of Yahweh our Elohim and the operations of his eternal pattern, purpose, and plan operating throughout eternity and to this present day. Now, this school is the result of a divine panoramic vision and revelation given to Henry Clifford Kennedy in the state of Ohio in the year 1931. He has incorporated schools throughout the United States, Canada, and certain other foreign countries. Archetype Pattern Workshop was established of February 2021. Now, in the school, we use and teach by the true and original names and titles for the Heavenly Father, the Word of Son, and the Holy Spirit, which are contained in the original Hebrew text. The true name for the Heavenly Father is Yahweh. It has been improperly substituted by Lord. The true title for the Word of Son is Elohim. It also been improperly substituted by God. And the true name for the Holy Spirit manifested in or out of a physical body is Yahshua. It has been erroneously substituted by Jesus Christ. Now the Lord and God, they are titles and not names. The Apostle Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many and God's many. We now know that each Lord must have a name and each God must have a name also. Elohim is a title, but unlike Lord and God, Elohim is a divine title. This means that Elohim is a title that our Creator chose for Himself. Jesus is a name, but Jesus is an erroneous name. A minor investigation on your part into a good dictionary or encyclopedia would prove that the Hebrew language, the Greek language, nor the Latin language have any characters or letters in their alphabet that would produce the sound made by this letter J. Neither was there a letter J in the English language until some 1400 years after the death of the Messiah. Therefore, such names as Jesus and Jehovah are impossible renderings for the true and original name of our Heavenly Father and His Son. Now, Christ is a title, just like Lord and God. Yahweh is pure spirit, and in this state, he's incomprehensible, inscrutable, and indiscernible. He is the ultimate source, substance, limits, and bounds of everything. You have Yahweh symbolized on this chart as a cloud. Now, Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose the cloud to symbolize himself, because a cloud is no particular or descriptive shape and form. We have drawn this cloud all around the edges of this chart to show you that everything on this chart is within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the whole universe abides within the pure spirit states of Yahweh. Yahweh, knowing that man could not perceive of him in his pure spirit state, took on shape and took on form right within himself as Elohim. This is the Word or Son, a superincorporably, that is, having the shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. Now the shape and form can only be seen in a divine vision and understood in a divine revelation. Later on, the self-same spirit manifests himself in a physical body and walked the earth plain as Yahshua the Messiah. The world calls him Jesus Christ. Now there's only one name given unto salvation, and we all must know this name. So the simple yet intelligent question we should ask ourselves is, what was the name of the Savior during the time that he walked the earth plain? A further understanding of this name and title could be had by reading the preface of the Holy Name Bible. Also in this school, we teach 
by the divine pattern of the universe. It is called a divine pattern because it is Yahweh's pattern. After Yahweh led the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, he called Moses on top of Mount Sinai and showed him a tabernacle pattern in a vision. He instructed Moses to build one exactly like it in the wilderness of Sinai. This pattern consists of a most holy place, a holy place, and a court round about. These three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. And we go forth in the school to prove that everything in the universe operates according to the structure and function of the threefold tabernacle pattern, and absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. Now the ten aims of the school are as follows. One is to help you find and know Yahweh or Elohim as he really is and as he actually exists. Two is to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah without the distinction of race, nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Third is to investigate the unexplained spirit law or so-called law of nature and the powers laid in man. Fourth is to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religions, psychology, philosophy, modern, practical, and occult science. Fifth is to extirpate current superstitions, skepticism, and ignorance. Sixth is to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensation and ages. Seventh is to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the devil, the serpent, or Satan and his demons, operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensation of time. And eighth is to earnestly contend for the common salvation of faith that was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. And ninth is to make known that Yahweh from the beginning ordained there is no other name given among men, whereby man must be saved, saving the name of Yahshua the Messiah, and tenth is to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of immortal glorification in the newer state. Our watchword is peace. Our slogan, speak the truth. This morning our prayer by Dr. Irene Ramirez, the scripture lesson is Romans, the second chapter, and scripture we read Dr. Irene Ramirez. And we have a selection of music after the prayer, which I didn't pick. Good morning, good afternoon, class. Good morning. We'd like to ask Yahweh again, our Elohim, to grant us some wisdom, knowledge, stability, and some strength to go on in these last days. And we ask this in his son's name, Yahshua Messiah. Let's all say, Hallelujah. Amen.
last. Good morning, class. Good morning. I'll be reading out of the Holy Name Bible containing the Holy Name versions of the Old and New Testament, critically compared with ancient authorities and various manuscripts, revised by the late A.B. Trainan, the Scripture Research Association. I'll be reading Romans, the second chapter. Therefore, thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art the judges. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of Yahweh is according to the truth against them, which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man that judgest them, which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of Yahweh? Or, or de despiseth thou that riches of his goodness and forbearance? and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of Yahweh leadeth thee to repentance. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasureth up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of Yahweh, who will render to every man according to his deed to them who by patient continu continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality eternal life. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first, and also of other nations. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good to the Jew first, and also to other nations. For there is no respect of persons with Yahweh. For as many as have sinned without, without, without law should, shall also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before Yahweh, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these have, having not the law, are a law to themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience, also bearing witness, and their thoughts, that the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. In the day when Yahweh shall judge the secrets of men by Yahshua the Messiah according to my evangel, behold, thou art called a Jew and restest in the law and makest thou boast of Elohim, thy boast of Elohim, and knowest his will and approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law, and art confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, and light of them which are in the darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge, and of the truth in the law. Thou therefore which teacheth another, teacheth thou not thyself, Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorreth idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law, dishonorest thou Yahweh. For the law of Yahweh is blaspheme, among the nations through you, as it is written, for circumcision verily profited if thou keep the law, but if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, in the uncircumcision, keep the righteousness of the law. Shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? 
and shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee, for by the letter and circumcision does transgress the law. For he is not a Jew, which is out, one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of Yahweh. I had read Romans, the second chapter. Let us all say, Hallelujah. All right, good morning once again. I know you noticed that we do have an addition to the class, a brand new Moses chart. And uh, as time goes on, we'll add another one and keep on adding till we get our seven, seven charts, okay? So this is one of seven. The next chart is, is gonna be the plan of salvation chart or uh, what you call the elementary chart. Okay, so uh, let's get started this morning. Our first speaker this morning will be Dr. Ari Ramirez. I'm really glad to see my son here today. Welcome to everyone that's out there. Morning and good afternoon out on the East Coast, South, West, North. Welcome. Welcome, Monia. You're always <laughs> listening. Anyway, I'd like to start today about this ages and dispensations chart. So we can see where we are right now. We start to learn about it. You know, before we come into this class, we need to know, know nothing about the ages of dispensation chart or what age we're really in. We just uh, thought we just were just coming about in the world, just walking around and listening to what everybody else says. Oh, this is the end of the age. I mean, the end of the world is coming to an end now with this epidemic and stuff. But what we come to find out is that if we listen and if we read the Bible, and listen to what our Savior is trying to tell us. Now, after we heard the new names, the, new, the old names, I'm sorry. To some of us, it might be new, but to all of us have been in the class a while. The names have been around since Yahweh gave them first. And he set it up when he walked the earth plane. Yahshua the Messiah, he set up for a way for us to learn of him. And he, listen, He's walking around, he's talking to his scribes, to the scribes and the Pharisees, he's talking to his disciples, and he's telling them where to begin in the Bible. So that's how we learn to read. So I want to get that verse. We always I always get it because that's the one I always go to. It's John 5 and 39. Let's start reading that, please. Now we're gonna start learning and seeing where he says to start to learn about this age of dispensation chart. So we can learn where we're at. We can learn where we come from. Go ahead, you have it. John 5 and 39. Ye search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. But ye will not come to me that ye might have life. I receive not honor from men, but I know you, that ye have not the love of Elohim in you. Okay, stop right there. Now he's telling them, the scribes and the Pharisees, and he's telling them, now, you won't come to him, or you won't listen to what he's saying, because you have not the love of Elohim in you. Because why? Because he was standing right there, right there with them at that time, telling them where was the love of Elohim is at. But it wasn't meant for them to know about that yet, or who he was. It just listen to his words. And he's telling you where to begin. Keep going, please. 43. And I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. Let another come in his own name. 
him you will receive. How can ye believe which receive honor one of another, and seek not the honor that cometh from Elohim only? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom ye trust. For he, for had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? And the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters having never learned? See, even them at that time, they're amazed at what this man is saying. They don't know that that's the love of Yahweh right there standing beside them, right there with them, in the midst of them. Now, this is Yahshua Messiah talking to them, and he's alive, walking around, just like we are right now, but he's knowing what's going on, and he's knowing what he's here to do. Now, he has a mission to do, but let's just keep going. Let's see, there's another one in here, Luke 24. Oh, I'm sorry, is it 24? 24, 24. Is it Luke? Where he's walking around, and this is after his death burial. Yeah, it's 24. You want me to start with one? No. Or? Give me the idea. Okay, uh, let's, start at, uh, let's start at 13, okay? Luke 24 and 13. And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about seven and one half miles. And they talked together of all these things which had, had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Yahshua himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that ye have one to another, as ye walk and are sad? Mm -hmm. And the one of them whose name was Cleopas, answering, answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass? there in these days? And he said unto them, What things? And they say unto him, Concerning Yahshua of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before Elohim and all the people. Okay, so right there. Now, this is after his death burial, and he rose out of the tomb already. And these two men are walking, they're all, you know, sorrowful, all sad, because they believed him to be a prophet of Elohim. So they're sad about him being crucified, and he's walking right there with them. But he's not letting them know, he's not letting them see the light that's right there with them. And he tells them that, as we read, that he was, you know, that he didn't know what happened, so they're trying to tell him what happened, that this Yahshua would have died on the cross. And he's telling them that, but he's not letting them see who he is. But later on, let's see, he's walking around, and he's letting them see him, but not that way, his resurrection. But uh, let's go ahead and drop down to 25 now. Luke 24 and 25. Then he had said unto them, O fools and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Messiah to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses. Okay, so right there. Now he's calling them all fools. Ought not to believe what the prophets have said. That means to go back to the law and to the prophets. You know, they had already said how this man was going to come about, the Savior, and was going to be crucified, and was going to be risen, be risen uh, the third day according to Moses' vision, according to what is said about him. Now, right there, he's walking around. This is, I was saying, he says this in the beginning. Of his, ministry, of his uh, ministry, saying what he come to do, right there in John five thirty nine, and also you know I, I skipped this one in Matthew three and thirteen. That's the beginning of his ministry when he's coming about to tell people what he's here for. 
Matthew 3 and 13. Yeah, let's start right there. I should have started there in the beginning, but I didn't. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, Mark, Matthew 3 and 13. Then cometh Yahshua from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be immersed of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be immersed of thee, and comest thou to me? And Yahshua answering said unto him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he permitted him. Yahshua, when he was immersed, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were open unto him. Okay. And okay, right there, Yahshua, he started his ministry right there. We read that. And like I said, John 5, 39 says, where to begin at? Yahshua tells him, where to start reading the Bible at? In the back of Moses. And at the time he was saying that too, you know, he's talking to the Jews, because that's who he related to, is the Jews, because that's what he, that's, if you follow the law at that time, he spoke to the Jews and he was telling them that to begin at Moses and the prophets, he's walking around after his death, burial, resurrection. He's telling them the same thing. And then his mission was to fulfill. He said right there to John, thus it becomes us to fulfill all righteousness. He was baptized. Okay. We go on from there. We start seeing how to read the Bible. And we start seeing about, okay, he says go back to Moses. So you go back to Moses, we're not going to go right there right now. When we start finding out, when we start reading, we start seeing the beginning, the creative age, when Yahweh created the day, the first day, the second day, the third day, how he created man right here in the antediluvian age, Adam, and he had breathed into him a life-giving spirit, a life-giving soul. And let's, let's read that real quick. Uh, Genesis, I think it is, uh, is a three, is a three and six, uh, Genesis. Or he breathed into um, the breath of life. I'm sorry. Hmm. We're a little bit slow, guys. Just hang in there. Okay. Uh, in the holy name, it's uh, two and four. In the holy name, two and four. Genesis. Genesis two and four. And Yahweh Elohim formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. A living soul. Okay. Right there. This is in this antediluvian age. And you know what? At this age right here, Yahweh only gave man only one command. And that was to that man, Adam. Where he said to him that he was not supposed to eat of the tree of life. We're going to read that part right here. Uh, going to read down where that law he was given to Adam. Okay, let's see. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and read 12. 2 and 12. Start there. Genesis 2 and 12. Okay. And Yahweh Elohim took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And Yahweh Elohim commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge and of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt die the death. And Yahweh Elohim said, It is not good that man, the man should be alone. I will make a help suitable for him. Okay, and then I will read that he gave his wife Eve. Now, that's this antediluvian age where Yahweh Elohim gave man just one law at this time. Okay, and after that, they're supposed to just keep going. Keep it says um, for for Adam and Eve just to go hide, go ahead and replenish the earth. Not replenish. I forgot how to say it. Populate. 
Populate the earth, yes. Have children. Be fruitful and multiply, that's the Buddha said. Right here in this Antipodean age. And they were just supposed to go ahead and do that. And they had that one law, but yet Yahweh had told them that they were supposed to only be obedient at this time right here. Now, I want to skip over that a little more, and I'm going to go down to the third age right here where Yahweh Elohim gave Moses. Now, Yahshua said to go back, if you want to learn about him, is to go back to Moses. Right here in this third age, that's the post illumination age, that means after the flood, with Noah. Now, Yahweh got upset with the way the people were doing it, but he already had known that this, the people were going to act like this. He, he already knew it. And if we read about it, he already, he's like, he forecasts everything. He does that in his sayings, what's going to happen. Through the prophets, he says what's going to happen. And right here with this age, dispensation, the third dispensation, he gave that law. This is where man has the law that they call the Ten Commandments law. But there was 613 law and ordinances that was given out in this post Olympian age. So he goes and he does that and he gives it to Moses up on top of this mount. He gives them the law that they're supposed to be doing. And he gave it only to Jews and Jews only. He had did this back. He had separated man from only the Jews. And if you aren't a Jew, you're a Gentile. That would you know Yahweh at this time. Yahweh would know who he was about, know his law, know what he came to do. And he set it up through who? Through Moses. That's why it's so important for everybody to go back and start reading Moses at the beginning. Me too, again, because I forget things. And, you know, it's not getting any easier with this getting older. You forget a lot of things. And so Yahweh comes about and he shows us again. So this is the end of the age where Moses, where Noah was told to go out and populate the earth again. And that the law was coming in through Moses. We read about it. We start reading about this Melchizedek and Abraham kingdom and priesthood. We start reading about the, the law of carnal harnesses, what they're about, and who they're pointing to. Because the world still, stay, still thinks that this law is pertaining to them. But they only picked the, the 10 laws. I said there were 613 ordinances. They only picked the 10 laws. And then there it says in there that if you did one law and if you broke it, you built it to all. And that's in the Bible. You just have to read it. Later on, it says in there too, that there was going to become Yahshua Messiah was going to come in and he was going to change it. He was going to put it in the hearts and minds of people, not in written pen or ink, not like the ones of stones that Moses got and put in the mount, not in tables of stone, not in for man to try and do. And that was in this age. That was before his death, burial, and resurrection, Yahshua Messiah. Now, after that is all done, after you start reading about Yahshua Messiah, and you start seeing how he's coming about, and he's fulfilling that, and you see it back in Moses, reading about Moses, and you see how everything is carried about, you start seeing Yahshua doing it, fulfilling it, the law. When he got baptized, we read about it. He wants to get baptized, that was it, especially at the cross right there. He said it too. He says um, over there, I think it's in uh, Colossians 2 and 10. Can you get that real quick? This is what he's doing. Colossians 2 and 10. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of the Messiah, buried with him by immersion, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith 
of the operation of Yahweh, who hath raised him from the dead. Okay, can we get, the, let's see, is it John 19? Because they say that you can't remember the scriptures to look at the, the charts because they tell the scriptures. Let's see, John 19. Okay, right here. Okay, John 19, and we're gonna get, uh, start at, go ahead and start at 30, go ahead. John 19 and 30. When Yahshua therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished, and he bowed his head and expired. The Jews therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain, upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was a high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and broke the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Yahshua and saw that he was dead already, they broke not his legs. Okay, go ahead and stop right there. Now I'm talking about Yahshua, and when he says he comes to fulfill, right there, that was his mission, to fulfill the law and the prophets, because Moses wrote about him, he said. Now he's fulfilling this one little instant, right there I can get, is that when they had did the Passover, the children of Israel, back down in Egypt, I'm skipping a whole bunch. That's why I say, go ahead back and read, so you can be able to understand and see this was going on but when they had children of Israel down in Egypt and there was ten devastating plagues were passed out, out there on the Egyptians that night I mean that days and they had to do a, how should I say they had to do this Passover and they had to do this thing that were when Yahweh Elohim had passed through the night he said that if he didn't see the blood on the houses of the Israelites, which is the Hebrews, that he was going to kill the firstborn. So they had to do this because they had to have this blood and this land in them so they could cross over the Red Sea into wilderness. Anyway, they had to do this and they had to do it exactly as he said. He said that, that they were not supposed to eat this land and they were not supposed to break the legs of this land. They were supposed to eat it in haste and eat it quickly like in haste means quickly, so they could go on, go on where? Go on to the wilderness, so they could worship Yahweh Elohim. So with us in this age, after Yahshua Messiah, died on the cross, nailed on his two hands, and from his feet, and the head crown of thorns, he, says he's going to put a new law into our hearts, in our minds. So this old law that the Israelites, the Hebrews were doing, that time no longer was in a hunger at all, which the age that we are in, this fourth age, it says fourth age, present kingdom age. We are supposed to worship him in spirit and in truth. Now Yahshua set it up for us how to learn about him, to go back to Moses. And now we're going to hear this Moses a lot because he referred to a lot. I didn't say it. He said it to go back to learn about him. So this now, this new law is going to be written in the hearts and mind. And he's doing it. Every time you come into class, you learn a little bit more about him. And you see where you're at right here. You're in this age right here. You're in the present kingdom age. And if you want to go on to have immortality with him, Yahshua Messiah, you can learn about him. And how are you going to learn about him? Going back to Moses, how are you going to get him in you to learn about him and to learn the truth about him? Um, I'm really just scrambling this up a little because uh, I want to see more of this. And I know that uh, he will show it to me more and more each time. But like I said, this new law is going to be written in the heart of mine. 
and we start learning about that. We start learning about each age, so much to each age, so we can see him. And as long as we keep on seeing him, we're going to keep on learning about him, and we're going to see the truth about him. Not everything that's out there is going on. You know, there's so many things going out in the world, like I said, that get you caught up in it. The politics, this pandemic that's going around, everything, even our own lives, we get so wound up in it, we forget to learn about him, Yahshua Messiah, and this new life that he's given us. Is, you know, there's be no more crying, no more pain, no more of this pandemic going on, no more of bills, no more nothing. Just peace with him. That's this new age. And that's where we're supposed to be at. And we're working towards getting even closer to that, the end. And uh, there's so much more to say, and I really didn't say a lot, but this is what I do believe. That Yahshua Messiah is guiding us, and he is taking care of us. And he is going to be our shield of everything that comes by. He's going to help us get through. So as long as we keep an eye on him, we are going to get through it. So that's all I can say. So everyone. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I know it's not easy coming up here and trying to explain the things that you know about Yahweh's purpose, you know, especially this age of dispensation chart. You know, uh, one thing I clarify is that the first age is a creative age, the angelic age, and the physical creation. That's where Adam was created. Then he was placed in the garden, and then you have the death of Adam. Okay? When he was kicked out of the garden, remember the sun was always at his zenith. Okay? Then when he transgressed the law or ate that fruit, okay, he was kicked out of the garden, he had the angel there with a flaming sword, okay, and then he had to eat bread from the sweat of his brow. The sun went down in darkness, and that's when time began, okay. So, you had little things that come to your mind when people go over these events, that we read, you know, and we try to remember. But uh, this is what this is what it is. It's a school. Okay? We do our research. And we sit and listen to these lectures. Okay? Uh, and uh, I'm going to call the next speaker. She can go up and show, tell us some things that she knows about Yahweh's purpose. Next speaker will be Dr. Rita on the net remarriage. was told by Moses from his vision. The, the world or the creation wasn't created in six solar days. It was created by the will of, of Elohim. And he spoke it into creation. And it, was, it didn't take six solar days to create it. Um, with that said, I'd like to um, go over, let's see, where is it at? I like to go over, um, Adam and Eve and, um, that Adam is the degeneration, the degenerator, and 
also um, point out that Yahshua the Messiah is the regeneration. So we have the degeneration of the first Adam and then the regeneration of the second Adam. Can we get um, 1 Corinthians? Um, we could start with 39. Read on down. Because um, it tells it tells about the um, the first Adam and the second Adam. So you want first Corinthians one? Um no, let's start with let's go ahead and just start with thirty nine, because it's a it's a long one. One thirty nine? No, first Corinthians I'm oh, sorry, uh fifteen and thirty nine. Sorry about that. Okay, fifteen and thirty nine. But I will have given it the body, and is it please him to every seed in his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of the beasts, another another of fishes, and another of birds. There is also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one of the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon, another glory of stars, for one star different from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. So it is written that the first Adam was made a living soul and the last Adam was made a life giving spirit. How be it that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterwards that which is spiritual. The first Adam is of, earth, is of the earth earthly, and the second Adam is Yahshua from heaven. As is the earth earthly, such are they also that are earthly. As the heaven, and as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. Okay, go ahead and stop there. So, while I was reading about um, the degeneration, the first man Adam, and the regeneration, the second man, uh, uh, second man Adam, I, I was kind of wondering, like, okay, who's the second Adam? And it says it there that it is it is Joshua. Um, now, the degeneration in the first Adam. The reason why he's a degenerator is because can we get can we look up degeneration just so everyone knows what that means. Okay, I have it. Um, degeneration. The state or process of being or becoming degenerate, decline or deterioration, um, deterioration or loss of function. Um, also, we can get um, degenerate. Having the, having the lost of the physical, mental, and moral qualities, considering normal and desirable, showing evidence of decline. Um, go ahead. 
Go ahead and there's another one that says the noun, an immoral or corrupt person, yes. um, decline or deteriorate. So this is a decline, um, basically what it's saying, a decline. Um, and the reason why this is because, um, you know, they were given like, um, the previous uh, speaker said they were giving one law, which was not to touch of that fruit of the tree. Um, let's go ahead and continue in that scripture in uh, Genesis um, after or right when he gives them the law and what happens. Uh, two and thirteen. And Yahweh 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 commanded the man stand saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest eat freely, freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt die the death. Okay, so dying the death means you're gonna die in your consciousness. Um, well, that, that's what happened. They died in their consciousness. They didn't die a physical death, they, they died a, in their consciousness. Go ahead and continue. And Yahweh said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a help suitable for him. And out of the ground, Yahweh Elam formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens, and brought them unto the man to see what he would call them. And whatsoever the man had called every living creature, that was his name, its name. And the man gave names to the all cattle and to the birds of the heavens and to all the beasts of the field. But for the man, there was not found a help suitable for him. And Yahweh Elam caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. And he took the rib and closed it up of the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which Yahweh Elam had taken from the man made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And he said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Shall she she shall be called woman, because she was taken out of the man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife were not ashamed. Okay, so go ahead and skip down to where they, um, where Eve was deceived. Can we just keep reading with her? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, three and one. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, and Yahweh Elohim had made. And he said unto the woman, Hath Elohim said, Ye should not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, Yahweh Elohim said, Ye shall not eat of it. Okay, go ahead and stop there. So right there, Eve knew um, knew better. She knew better, however, she, um, when we continue to read, it's gonna reveal you know, that she was tricked. She was deceived. So go ahead. Elohim said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, no death will you die. For Elohim doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall know ye shall be as Elohim, knowing good and evil. And the woman, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave it unto also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Okay. So we know that. Elohim gave them that law that in the day that they touch of the fruit, they shall surely die. So let's go ahead and skip down to when he's um, giving them their, um, when, he's, when he's questioning them when they're naked in the garden, or when they're covered up. Okay. Um, uh, oh, eight. Huh? Just keep on reading, eight. And they heard the voice of the of Yahweh Elohim as they walk, walk as they were walking in the garden in the cool of the day. 
and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of Yahweh Elohim among the trees of the garden. And Yahweh Elohim called unto the man and said unto him, Where is thou? And he, is, he, and he said, I hear thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldst not eat? The man said, The woman whom thou gavest to me, she gave, it, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. Okay, go ahead and stop there. So, um... So Adam did freely take that fruit from Eve. He knew what was going to happen because he was told, and he was told to, to obey. So he took that from, from Eve. And let's go ahead and continue. I just wanted to make that clear. And Yahweh Adam said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And Yahweh Adam said unto the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. He shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And to the woman he said, I will greatly multi multiply thy pain, and in, in thy conception. In pain thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and ye shall rule over thee, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. Okay, go ahead and stop there. So Elohim is telling him, um, Because you hearkened, which means you you knew what the consequences were going to be, but you still took it. Now there's a there's a reason why he did that, because he's pointing to the second Adam. He did that. He willingly died for his bride, just as the second Adam, which is Yahshua the Messiah, willingly died for his bride. Um, so I just wanted to point that out as well, that he willingly took that fruit and willingly died for his bride. Um, go ahead and continue. Sorrow shall thou eat of all the days of thy life. Thorns of thistle shall I eat, shall bring forth to thee. And thou shalt eat the herbs of the field. In the sweat of thy face shall thou eat bread, till, till thou return to the ground. For out there was thou was taken, and thus thou art. Unto dust shall thou return. And the man Adam called his wife Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Unto Adam also he, to his wife, did Yahweh Elohim make coats of skin, and clothed them. And Yahweh Elohim said, Behold, the man is become as one of us, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand to take the tree of life, and eat, and live forever, Therefore Yahweh Elohim sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove the man and placed him in the east of the Garden, Eden of Eden cherubim, cherubs, and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So, no, go ahead and stop. So they were kicked out of the Garden and they were never to be returned. So that is the degeneration of um, the first the first Adam, which kicked off the degeneration of man. Um, and we know that Yahshua the Messiah, like I said, willingly died for his bride, um, is the regeneration of man. So um, I'd like to yield the floor now. Um, let us all say hallelujah.
you want to say something? I could give a lecture. Okay. All right. Our next speaker will be my son, Dr. Ignacio Ramirez Jr. Can you hear me with this mask on? Yeah. Okay. All right. It's been a while since I've spoken about this, this teaching. So what I'd like to do is take a step back a little bit and go into the basics of it. The basics of everything. Um, this is the only reason why I even use the Bible for anything. Because without this, people generally seem that the Bible is just a bunch of fairy tales. You know, there, there's really, they don't feel that there's anything of substance in the Bible. They try to read it, but they just really don't understand it. The reason why they don't understand it is because they don't understand this. They don't understand the pattern. Um, and there is quite a bit of things that go into the pattern, but what I want to do is go into the extreme basics of it. Um, so, what we have here is a threefold pattern. This is one tabernacle pattern, so this is three in one configuration. Now, this pattern was given to Moses up upon Mount Sinai in his uh, second trip into the mount. Uh, first, he did the uh, creation, and yes, the, it, the creation wasn't done in six days. It was because Moses was in there, and then Yahweh was explaining to Moses in six days what happened. Uh, and then, for the rest of the time that he was in there, he was showing him the structure and the function of the tabernacle, which he was supposed to build. Can you get that for me? Okay, Exodus, uh, let's see, right? You want to start where Exodus 24 and, and 18? And Moses went up into the midst of the cloud and got up in the mount. And Moses was in the mount 40 days and 40 nights. Okay, 25 and 9. Oh, at 8 of oh, Exodus 25 and 8. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them, according to all that I showed thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle, of all the instruments thereof, even shall you make it. Okay, so that is where the tabernacle pattern was given to man. Right. This is the pattern. Now, within the pattern, you see all these different vessels in it. There are more things in the tabernacle, but these are the major vessels. So, when people see this, they see, oh, this might be something that is just in the Bible. But what they really don't know is this is the pattern of everything. Everything in existence goes by this pattern. You can see uh, an atom, pro uh, proton, neutron, electron. The electron goes around the proton and neutron in a, in a cloud-like shape, cloud-like form, and it rotates all around it, just like we have the court round the bell that goes all around the tabernacle. So we also have something that people can look into. Past, present, future. Also, you have um, the human cell. We have the nucleus, nucleolus, and the cell body. There are more parts in the, in the human cell, just as there's more parts in the tabernacle, but we're just going through the extreme basics here. Now, there is also you, you go by the pattern. You have a head cavity, chest cavity, and abdominal cavity. There are more parts to your arms and legs, which are, as a structure of the tabernacle pattern, there are more things to it, but these are just the basics of it. So there's also the uh, matter. Now matter is solid, liquid, and gas. 
Now people might say, oh, I got you there, because isn't there a fourth state of matter, plasma? What they don't understand is how this pattern works. There is a structure and there is a function of this pattern. Now, in the Bible, there is this one, um, one scripture. It says, Yahweh is a consuming fire. Did you get that? One scripture that just says Yahweh is instituting fire. fire. <laughs> and then there's also this other one that I want to get. It's in Leviticus, uh, I think it might be the 16th mm -hmm. chapter. Um, I can, it's Deuteronomy 4 and 24, but I can, you want me to start with one It says, For Yahweh thy Elohim is a consuming fire. Even a jealous L. That's fine. That's fine. That's all I needed. Um, it, it talks about how Aaron and his son were mixing the um, incense. Yeah. Incense. Uh, yep. What the bit is. Yeah, it should be here. Offered up strange fire. Strange smelling herbs. Yeah. So, so what I'm doing while they're getting into it is I'm showing part of the function of the tabernacle. We'll get into that after this. Okay. I have it. It's ten, Leviticus 10 and 1. And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon and offered strange fire before Yahweh, which he commanded them not. Amen. And there went out fire from Yahweh and devoured them, and they died before Yahweh. Keep going. Then Moses said unto Aaron, This is it that Yahweh spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me, and before all the people I will be glorified, and Aaron held his peace. And Moses called Michael and Elizaphan, the sons of Uziel, the uncle of Aaron, and said unto them, Come near, carry your brethren from before the sanctuary out of the camp. So they went near and carried them in their coats out of the camp, as Moses had said. And Moses said unto Aaron, and unto Eliezer, and unto Ithamar, his sons, uncover not your heads, neither rend your clothes, lest ye die, and lest wrath come upon all the people. But let your brethren, the whole house of Israel, bewail the burning which Yahweh hath kindled. Keep going. There, and one. ye shall not go out from the door of the tent of the congregation, lest ye die, for the anointing oil of Yahweh is upon you. And they did according to the word of Moses. And Yahweh spake unto Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine, nor strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee. When ye go into the meeting tent of the congregation, lest ye die, it shall be a statute forever, forever throughout your generations. And that ye may put difference between holy and unholy. There's this one part where it says that I will appear in the cloud. Not to enter all time into the into yes. most holy place where I will appear. Telling the mountain not to go beyond the veil. Leviticus 16 and 2. Mm -hmm. 
Leviticus 16 and 2. And Yahweh said unto Moses, Speak unto Aaron thy brother, that he come not at all times into the holy place within the, the veil, before the mercy seat which is upon the ark, that he die not. For I will appear in the cloud. There you go. The I will seat. appear in the cloud. So what are the what are the properties of plasma? You know that it's hot and emits light. Yahweh is a consuming fire, and he emits light. Um, so that is where your plasma is. So there is in the fourth state of matter, because remember, solid, liquid, gas. Um, plasma is superheated gas, which is in the most holy place. It's like fire. Okay, so in this tabernacle, that is just the basic structure. Uh, holy most holy place, holy place, support round about. Now we have, right here, we have these steps. First step, second step, all the way up to seven. What these do is outlines the rungs, like in um, Jacob's Ladder. You can read that later on your own. But right here, let's just go over the steps, and then we'll also go over the vessels that are in it. Um, okay, so the first, uh, the first step is the gate where you have to enter in for the sacrifice. Um, and you'll be able to read that in, uh, I think it's Exodus and, and also uh, in the law. The second step is the brazen, um, the altar of sin sacrifice. The altar of sin sacrifice is where, you, where they put the sacrifice on to be forgiven. So, because when you sin, something has to die. That, that's in the law. So they also have like, in the law, when, um, when you do like a specific sin, you're supposed to give a specific animal. If you don't have this animal, then they, there is a lot of detail in there, and it, it goes on. So the third step is the brazen uh, water labor. That's where uh, various washings are done. And on the fourth step is the door. The door with the uh, holy anointing oil, where you have to anoint the priest so they can officiate within the pattern, because that's part of, the, part of the function. Now the fifth step is the most holy place. In the most holy place, you have the um, seven branch golden candlesticks the table of shoe of bread, and the altar of incense. So uh, we also say light, bread, and intercessor. When you, when you look through all of these um, plates in the 40-plate uh, chart or in this elementary chart, you start noticing these things um, in there. And that's how you can actually know that there is a Yahweh in existence. Without this pattern, what do you have? What do you have that you know? You, you just believe? You believe because somebody tells you, oh, you, you know, you have to be holy and you have to do all these laws because that's what God said. How do you know? This is how you know. Uh, the sixth step is the veil of the flesh. That's the veil, or the veil that covers the most holy place. And the seventh step is the most holy place. In the holy place, you have the two archangels that are facing toward each other upon the um, Ark of the Covenant. So these are the seven steps of the tabernacle. Um, and this is how, like I said, you can know that there's a Yahweh that's in existence. This is how you can know that there's Yahshua in existence too. Because there is this function. There is you, you, there's sacrifice, washings. As uh, Nanette was going over, in the in degeneration and then regeneration, Yahshua had to fulfill. He had to fulfill everything. He had to be the sacrifice. He had to go through and get baptized unto John. He had to, he had to fulfill everything. And this is how you point out who Yahshua is, too. So there is plenty more in, that you can go into. You can go into and correlate it with the human body. You can correlate it with all these plates here. This is the reason how and why I know that Yahweh exists. Without this, everyone would just be talking nonsense. There, there really isn't, I, I couldn't even in good conscience even use the Bible to do anything if this wasn't in it. This is something easy that even a child can understand. Just one, two, three, three in one configuration. This is something that 
should be in, people should be introduced to at the very beginning when they come into the class. Um, well, one of the many things, and then it can go on to you know, the vision and everything. And you know, a lot of people when you start telling them that there's a man that had a vision, they they start you know going, oh, this is one of them. But once you start proving, hey, this guy did have a vision. Things had to be pointed out to us for us to understand what was going on in the Bible. Because there are plenty of people that read the Bible and they think that they understand what it is, but they don't have this. They don't have the guidelines. They don't. They can't prove that God exists, or Yahweh exists, or whatever else that they believe in. So, with that said, I think I'll give up the floor, and I hope somebody got something out of this. Okay, uh, man, I really enjoyed this, you know, because uh, it's, it's like what it says, if you didn't have this pattern, how can you prove the existence of Yahweh? You know? In the moderation, we go over this pattern a little bit, how it came to be, okay? Now, there's some reason during the week I was thinking about the pattern, you know? And uh, when I first uh, knew anything about this teaching, it was told to me that if I knew anything about a pattern, I go, no, I didn't know nothing about a pattern. You know, but it's in the Bible, you know, and all things are made by the pattern. Uh, this morning it was mentioned, there's a, a verse that says that you must worship Yahweh in spirit and in truth. You know, here Romans 119 and 20. Romans 1.19 Because that which may be known of Yahweh is manifest in them. For that which may be known of Yahweh is manifest in them. Okay, you want to know something about Yahweh? It's manifest in you. Read. For Yahweh hath showed it unto them. Okay. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and supernal nature, so that they are without excuse. Okay, so I was giving you some examples, but there's no excuse not to know Yahweh. Even from the creation, we went over it a little bit this morning. Okay, this creative age, the angelic and the physical age. Okay? And then how, uh, well, I don't want to go ahead of myself. But anyway, it talks about, we have a, 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 read that last part of Romans 1920, the supernal nature. Because that which may be known of Yahweh is manifest in them. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and supernal nature, so that they are without excuse. What is the supernal nature? Okay. Well, that's up here in the chart. Moses sees this uh, figure of a man without flesh and blood. Okay. Yahweh is pure spirit. Okay. He's invisible. He's abstract. You can't just invisible. You can't make heads or tails. You, you say, God, what comes into your mind? Oh, a figure of man. But Yahweh is pure spirit. Okay? Uh, get John 4, I think 4, and it says, For Yahweh is spirit. And some Bible says Yahweh is a spirit. But no, Yahweh is spirit. The 4 and 4. It's um, in the Elohim book, it's 4 and 24. 4 and 24. 
Okay, so I inserted Yahweh. Do you want me to read it, what it says in For it is to get the part where it says Yahweh is spirit. For Yahweh is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Okay, for Yahweh is spirit. Describe to me spirit. Well, you can't because you can't see it. That's the invisible thing, the invisible part of Yahweh. Moses couldn't see it, so he showed it to him. Okay? He stood there as Elohim. Okay? Read. Uh, can I add this too? Um, <clears throat> get away. Does say, I just want. Hello? Is it up? Oh, he's got to speak loud. Okay, I just want to add one, one thing too, because it does say Yahweh is a spirit. Right. Okay. But if you receive, uh, read Ephesians 4 and 4, I think, it just it just proves that there is only one spirit. Right. You want us to get it? Yeah. Ephesians 4 and 4. There is one body and one right. spirit, even as ye called in one hope of your calling. Right, right. One spirit, one hope. Yahweh is spirit. Okay. The shape and form. Okay. Then later on, manifested in the flesh. That's the supernal nature of Yahweh. Okay. He has the power uh, uh, to. Uh, I don't want to say the wrong words. What was that? Transmute. Transmute. Yeah, the power of transmutation. Okay, from one state to another state. Okay, invisible, visible, and concrete. It's like that's what I'm saying. Uh, most holy place, holy place, court run about. Okay, invisible, visible, concrete. Threefold. That's Yahweh. Okay. Where in the churches or out there do they teach this? How do they prove that there is a God? Okay. And then you have to worship Him in spirit and in truth. Okay. That's what you're doing when you when you're learning about Yahweh and His purpose. Okay. Now. Uh, let me see. Right. Ignatius was going over the tabernacle, right? And the steps they're in. And also, I want to point out that at the, at the fourth step, we have the door. That's the first veil. Okay? That if you close it, you won't see the door. Okay, you close that veil, you can't see the door. Once that veil is open, then you should see the door. Right here we have the veils open. When Messiah says, I am the door. Okay. But if they're closed, you won't see the door. Okay. That's one thing I was thinking about. You know, the, the first veil, the second veil. Concealing and revealing. Okay. Now, if you're obedient, that's what we're taught. In Romans, the scripture that says, be obedient. What do you say? Be obedient to the law? Or be obedient to Yahweh? You know? This is what Israel was given. Israel, the Jews, were given this physical law. Okay? Ten commandments, ceremonies, circumcision, all these things. They have to do. If they didn't, what well, was said? They had to bring, they broke the law, they had to bring a sacrifice and put it on this altar here. Take the blood, put it on the four horns, okay, to make an atonement for their sin. Okay? Well, when the Messiah said, let's get uh, Matthew 3 and 17. Okay. Matthew 3 and 17. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I believe. No, uh, 17, uh, 5 and 17. Excuse me. This is. 5 and 17. This is what the reason the Messiah was walking around the earth playing for. 
Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. To fulfill. Fulfill what? Okay. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one yod, or the smallest part of a letter, shall in no wise pass from the law to all be fulfilled. The law to all be fulfilled. He said while he was walking around, in the beginning of his ministry, that he was going to move this thing out of the way. Not destroy it, because that's what they were thinking, the people that followed him. They always bring in something new. No, he's just going to move it out of the way because why? They couldn't keep it. It was impossible. They couldn't even keep the first Ten Commandments, though there's 600 and something other laws and statutes that they had to do. It was impossible. But he came to perform these things that they couldn't do. That while they were up here in the mount, while Moses was up there and the law was spoken, down to the people, they all said after Moses wrote it down in the book, took the blood of calves, okay, sprinkled the people with the blood, sprinkled the book with the blood, okay, made, made a covenant, okay, there's something about the, about making covenants without sprinkling of blood, okay, and they all agreed they were going to keep that law. So when they built this golden calf up here because they're they're wondering about Moses being up here in the mount, you know, in this fiery cloud, you know, because the thunders and lightnings, they, they, you know, we wouldn't be any different. We'd say, man, this guy perished up there, you know, we haven't seen him in X amount of days. He didn't take a lunch or anything with him, any water. So what, our, what come to our minds is, you know, this guy Moses, he ain't coming back. So they begged Aaron to go down there, and Aaron said, well, take off your gold and your earrings, your rings, and throw them in the fire, you know? And what came out was a golden calf. And they said, this is the album that brought them out of the land of Egypt. I don't remember seeing any golden calf taken out of that. That's what the children of Israel said, and they partied. So after Yahweh all of them showed Moses the six days of creation, and on the seventh day he rested, and then after that, to the third three days, how to construct this tabernacle in every detail. The nine principal vessels, okay? Three in this compartment, three in this compartment, three in this compartment. Down here was all brass, highly polished brass, which you ever seen a highly polished brass? Kind of looks like gold. Here it was gold, golden vessels. These two compartments, golden vessels. Okay, and all and all the things that the high priest had to do, you know, all the uh, everything from changing the water, it was given to Moses while he was up in the mount. Okay. Now when he came down, Yahweh. Uh, Joshua turned to him and says, I hear a noise of war in the camp. Okay? And he told Moses, get down. So as soon as Moses, see Moses right here by the table of stones? This is the one that Yahweh had him written with his fingers. Okay? He took those table of stones because he saw what was going on down here. And he broke those tables of stone beneath the, beneath the, beneath the mount. Okay? Now, Moses got, I said he waxed hard. I'm not going to go through it because it's a lot of reading. It's up to you to go and read these things. And he got mad because after all the things that he saw, it's like I mentioned here in the angelic age, in the physical age, you see man being created, placed in the garden, okay? And then the woman being taken out of the man. Okay. Another thing, another thing is to allow him. Shows that he is female and male within himself. Okay. Just as Adam was a figure or a type of Elohim. He was male and female. And the reason why we know because Yahweh took the woman out of the man. 
took the womb out and created a woman. Okay? So we have these, these events, historical events that Moses wrote about, but he saw in this panoramic vision. Okay? The first man, male and female. Later around, the woman was taken out. Okay? Okay, now, so we have this creative age here, okay? Let's uh, see, we're going on in Romans 1, 19, 20. Uh, so by learning these things, they're being written in our heart and mind, okay? These laws are given to the Jews, the Jews only, okay? Now, the Gentiles, they're going around performing things on their own, you know, making up things because they witnessed the things that the, that the Jews, they couldn't help because they had a big old temple and stuff, you know. And they seen the things Yahweh would do for them and stuff. Well, they wanted, you know, to the copy this stuff too, you know. So they were, uh, the verse that they did unto themselves the things uh, contained in the law, you know, the Gentiles. But later on, the Gentiles are going to be brought in too, okay, by faith, okay. Now, when the Messiah went to the cross, get Colossians 2.14. Colossians 2 and 14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was con contrary to us. Now, who's writing? Who's, who's, who, who's, who wrote this letter here? This epistle? Paul. Paul's a Jew. He says, that was against us. So what age is that? That's after the age, or after Pentecost. Okay. Spiritual kingdom age. Okay? We have it here. Present age. Present kingdom age. Spiritual, spiritual kingdom on earth. Okay? After the day of Pentecost. Okay? Which ushered in a new age. And that's the age we're in. That's what Paul is writing about. Read. And took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. So he took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. I remember when I was brought by one of my older brothers to class, and he was looking at this chart. It was about the same size as this, a little bigger. And he noticed, hey, look at the nails, you know. I said, well, yeah, it's an example showing that these things he took to the cross, and we have the, the nails in his hands and in his feet, you know. And he, he was following along with the with the, 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 the story there, you know, the lecture. But uh, yeah, this thing, he took these things, nailed it to his cross. But I, I, after coming to his teaching, I see these people walking around in big old crosses and stuff, you know. I don't get it, you know. Uh, whole Christendom is wearing these crosses, but the cross represents a death, okay? But they don't realize they got their own cross because if you look, just like your son says, you look at this tabernacle, you study, especially the third volume, it talks about your cross you have. In the back, you have this, uh, I forgot the name of the bone, then you have your spine, spine that creates a cross. So you're bearing your own cross, and what's hanging on there is flesh, just like this cross here. His flesh hung on this cross, okay? Now, so he moved it all away, read. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphantly over them in it. Let no one condemn you regarding sacrificial meal and drink offerings made on the holy days, new moons and Sabbaths, which are a shadow of the things to come. Now, he moved those out of the way, so... You know, the adversary has uh, tricked people into believing that if they do these things, they'll be saved. Let's get uh, Thessalonians, it talks about the mystery of iniquity. Let's see. 
Thessalonians or Timothy? I think it's Thessalonians. You know. Because during the time after the resurrection, okay, there's a, a great uh, like you said, persecution of the Yahshua. Those that believed in the, in the resurrection of Yahshua, okay, they were being persecuted and put to death. You got it? Is it the let no man to see? Yeah. Uh, second Thessalonians, second chapter, um, third verse. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Okay, there's another one that says that he already worketh. He's seeing that, but he's talking about John of the Isle of Patmos. He was the last apostle to live, okay, after Pentecost. He was on this island of Patmos, Aegean Sea, in uh, AD 96, where he received the divine panoramic vision. He's the one that wrote Revelation, okay? He's looking towards Moses, and Moses is looking towards him. See how they're facing? The two witnesses. Why do we have the two witnesses? Well, right here in the most holy place, we have this threefold configuration here. He gave a chest, it has a seat, okay? In his chest was the Ten Commandment Law that was written by Yahweh. Okay, the second set of stones, okay? Aaron's rod that budded, okay? A jar of manna was in this, this chest, on top of it was a seat, okay? And you have these two archangels here, or uh, cherubims, witnessing in the cloud. Okay, witnessing like Michael and Gabriel. So we have our example here. They're witnessing in the cloud with Moses and John. They're not looking at each other, but they're witnessing. Okay, read. This is for that Madison shall be revealed some of the mystery of. Hmm? Yeah. But anyway, it says that mystery of iniquity. It was already working back then. Because we see it here. The death of the apostles. Okay? Death of the, the Yashmans. And when that, that goes into Paul. Okay? Paul thought he was doing the, the right thing by going around persecuting these guys, putting them to death. Because they weren't following the law. Well, that's all he knew. Okay? He was a Pharisee. Called him the Pharisee of Pharisees. He believed in the resurrection. Right? But he's still out there persecuting these. You got it? Yeah, I got it. It's the same chapter. Okay. Uh, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, um, verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. See, it's already working. It was working back there. Read. Only he who now restraineth will restrain until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom Yahshua shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the workings of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness, of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Okay. So that one John had to be taken out of the way. Anybody that wanted to confirm anything about Yahshua had to go to John, the last eyewitness. Okay. Now, this mystery of iniquity was already working. Reestablished cardinal ordinances. Mystery Babylon. There's a verse and in Revelation talks about Mystery Babylon. Okay? The great whore. Okay. Drug these cardinal ordinances over to this side. Now they got people believing in this stuff that wasn't even given to them in the first place. 
okay? Uh, there was a thing that was going around when I like, first came and it says, uh, uh, the flesh is out. I could never understand what they're saying, the flesh is out, you know? Some people meant it somewhere, uh, some like his physical body, his physical creation was out. You know, the flesh is out. But what I come to realize and what I was, was taught was these carnal ordinances, this pointing to the flesh. To be carnally minded is death. You know, you want to call yourself carnal? What are you saying? You're saying you're dead. We're not dead. We're over this side. We were carnal before because we're minding carnal things. Okay? We were doing these things. We thought we had salvation and doing some type of righteousness. I don't care whatever. Whatever you conjures up in your mind that you thought was righteous, helping somebody, giving somebody some money to eat or whatever, and you thought that was brownie points for you. That's carnal. Okay. Well, that's what we should do. You know, we see a fellow man and, you know, help him out. That's the way it's always should have been. Okay. We didn't have to get points for it. No, but that's the way it's been since we were growing up. Those that were raised in churches and stuff like that, we were taught to do those things that uh, it'll please God. And if you do those things and keep his law, or some kind of righteous, you know, be saved. No. Uh, John three sixteen. Did you want that verse right there where it says a big one law you got to draw? Yeah. Okay, James two and ten. For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and ye append in one point, he is guilty of all. So they're giving ten commandments here. They built this golden calf. The first law it says, "Thou shalt not build anything under the law above the, I mean, under the earth above the earth, in the water. You know, thou shalt not worship it. You know, that's the first thing they did. The first law. Well, if they break this one law, you're guilty of all the rest of them. You broke them all, so you got to start all over again. You know, so." Uh, 316. John 316. For Yahweh so loved the world. Now, this is something that I remember from my childhood, sitting in church and stuff, and I always kept this, and I always believed it, Read. For Yahweh so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So I believed at that time in Jesus Christ. And that was good enough for me, you know, because it said there, if you believe him, you have everlasting life. Who could argue with that? You know? But it was wrong. Because I believed in Jesus. And Jesus is erroneous. When we come into this teaching, in this school, or in these, in these institutes where they're preaching the truth, okay, we find out by being obedient to the Savior, we have to go back to Moses, and we find out that Yahweh revealed his name to this man back here. No one else before him knew anything about his name. I know it's written there in Genesis. They have Lord, God, all this stuff. But their titles are not names. Who put them there? Moses put them there. And that's what we're learning about this panoramic vision given to Moses. You have five minutes. Okay. So, we see that to believe in the Messiah, you got to be obedient. Just like I talked about in the scripture lesson. Not obedient to this law, but to the spiritual part of it. Okay? Um, yeah. So, you know, all my life I believe, you know, I, I can't, I'm too confused because it says so, you got to do so many things and if you don't do it, you know, and, and the minister doesn't approve of it, and you got problems, you know. You walk around guilty, you have the uh, guilty conscience, you know. You're not doing something, but he says if you believe in him, you will 
you're going to be saved. You have everlasting life. Until you come into one of the schools, then you really understand what you have eternal life. Okay? Now, you show we have to be obedient to Yahshua's story. He said, go back to the law of the prophets. Okay? Like it was spoken this morning. Go back to the law of the prophets. Okay? It talks about Yahweh. Okay? It talks about Yahweh and his son, Yahshua the Messiah. That he was to come. That's what the prophets are testifying of. Okay? For the Messiah to come. The first Adam point to the second Adam. First Adam was from the earth earthly. The second Adam was Yahweh from heaven. This is the second Adam. Okay. This is the regeneration. Because after he raised from the dead, okay, those that believed in him marched into Jerusalem and were seen by many. And that was not just five people. I mean five souls. That's from Adam all the way up to the Messiah. Those that believed in uh, a savior to come, okay. So, yeah, it was a, a good class today. Uh, I don't know how many people can stay at their whole family was here and participate, you know. And uh, that's one thing that I, I pray to Yahweh for. Before I took off the flesh, that it would bring my family in, you know, my grandson here, and hopefully one day my granddaughter be here. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm satisfied, I'm ready, you know. So, uh, yeah, so uh, I'm glad that whoever turned in, uh, tuned in, and uh, appreciate that. Uh, your donations and all that uh, will help us, uh, you know, get more charts and stuff, and pay for the room and whatever. Nobody gets paid here for anything. It's all donated. Uh, you know, it's a non-profit. Uh, Will is still out. He'll hopefully he'll be here next week. Okay, and uh, here is uh, his uh, testimony on the journey back east and stuff. I know that they're getting bad weather back there, so hopefully he's safe and he'll be back here. Okay, uh, I'll ask him that to come up here and give the doxology, and uh, we'll see you next week. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise Elohim, our Savior, through Yahshua the Messiah, our Sovereign, belong glory and majesty, dominion and power, both before all time, now and ever. Let us all say, Hallelujah.